John Del Vecchio. He's a MSF rider coach, and uh, I don't know what else he does, but something. So please uh, you know, listen to him. We may learn something. We may not. We may be able to teach him something. Okay? Is that good enough? That's great. I'm not going to do any great. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, John. All my credentials. Um, that and 250 to get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Mm -hmm. um, Welcome. Uh, I know many of you, some I do not. Um, so I'm, my name is John Del Vecchio, and uh, I, I was thinking of a couple of different things. I, I really didn't know what to call this presentation. It was it was difficult. I got a couple seats up here if anybody wants to come in here, uh, some friends, whatever. Um, but I came up with vision, friend or foe. Uh, what is that? What do you think I'm going to talk about? And this is interactive at times. What do you think I'm going to talk about? With vision. See and be seen. That's, again, that was one of the names I called it. Uh, well, how did I come up with this topic? Why this topic? Could have picked anything. It all started, I guess, back in the spring around May time. I read this article written by a fighter pilot. And he also rides and it, uh, he compared a lot of the skills fighter pilots learn with riding a motorcycle and it to me it was just it was like an aha moment it was such important information I think I already knew at that point in time that I was going to talk about it the next time I came here because I wanted to see what's really behind I didn't see him has anyone ever heard this we talk about this a lot um, I didn't see him, and so I accumulated as many techniques as I possibly could um, and tried to make them simple. Something that I could do, something that you could do to make, um, to, to fix some of these, these innate problems. And just understand, I'm trying to master these skills myself as well, and presenting it, this information to you is helping me, so I'm probably getting more out of this um, than, than you, perhaps, even. Uh, I'm going to explain also that both the rider and car drivers are both susceptible to vision flaws that cause crashes. Uh, think about an awareness campaign that you saw recently. Um, we're going to take a look at some here, and it may be a problem with the eye itself and not blaming people. Take a look at some of these. Just, just stop for a moment and read some of these. Who do you think the target market is for these awareness campaigns? Um, drivers. Car drivers. Car drivers, right? So um, if you think about it like that, they're directed towards car drivers. Now if a motorcycle and a car come together, there's, there's two parts to that story, and, and these, we take half the blame for the, for the collision of one side, and we, sh we push it over onto the other side. This implies that, hey, we, there's nothing wrong with us. Of course it isn't. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> My first heckle of the day. Uh, so I'd like to start with, so I'd like to just start by how to talk about how we process images. Again, I'm not a doctor, I'm just a simple uh, school teacher. But uh, we're going to take a look at some things here. You have your central vision. Um, the part of the retina called the fovea is this two to five degree swatch in front of us, and that's what we use to see detail and high resolution i.e. hazards. It also goes vertically, and, and so think of like a cone that comes out. And what it allows us, it allows us to do is focus in the center, and we can really see, okay, there's a Cadillac there, a bend in the curve. But then we also have that peripheral vision around the other side. So let's take a look at just central vision in the problem central vision has. First of all, it requires we move our eyes to see detail so our brain can process it. If we don't move our eyes, we're going to miss a lot of things. 
Central vision is poor at detecting movement. There's also this thing that I, I learned, uh, I'm in my 40s, and this, I learned about macular degeneration. This is frightening to me, that, you, that as you age, this could happen to you, that you could actually lose your, the, the central vision in your eye. Well, what good are identifying problems if we don't come up with solutions? So here are just some things that uh, we can do um, in, a, in a general sense. Frequently jump or sweep your eyes across your entire field of view. So instead of zoning in on one particular thing, sweep your eyes, and we'll even talk that there's jumps that you might make across your entire field of view. When it comes to just about everything else, you know, with, with how well you see, you should see an eye doctor. Um, I don't really know my eye doctor very well, but I want to start to, to spend more time there because they can help with these things before they become problems. Now the next thing, of course, is peripheral vision. Uh, in self-defense, they say peripheral vision is good. What, like, why would you want to, in self-defense, pay attention to your peripheral vision? Well, those are where the hazards come from. That's right. Well, when we're riding or in our car, self-defense equals defensive riding. That's, we need to have that same warning system that you might get. Now, if you take a look, we get an awareness outside our immediate point of focus with our peripheral vision. So imagine just riding down the road or driving your car and all you had was central vision. Would you be able to see a deer over here? No, how about children playing? You wouldn't be able to see those things and that's why peripheral vision works together. It is good at detecting movement. So if we're fixating on something, we can maybe sense movement around that, that area we're fixating on. But it provides low detail. You're not going to be able to really draw a sketch of someone in your peripheral vision. And it also directs our central vision for details. If I hear the phone ring, I might turn my head, right? Or if I see the door open, hey, did my friend show up to listen to me today? It directs, I can see some movement, and it draws my central vision. Now here are some problems with peripheral vision and driving. Smaller objects are harder to see. This is also an interesting point. At higher speed, your peripheral vision constricts. Now the red dot in the middle, that's your central vision, and what and I put that in there because I don't want you to confuse central versus the peripheral. As you pick up your speed, the left picture is a 15 mile an hour uh, speed. At 30, you can see what happens to your peripheral vision. You may, if you slow down going through town, you might pick up these, these hazards. If you're flying through town, you might miss them. Another one, don't shoot the messenger. Cell phone use constricts peripheral vision. This could be the same, the same speed now. You're on the phone, you're not on the phone. And uh, it has that effect as well, constricting what you can catch in your peripheral vision and aging. Well, let's get rid of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nothing we can do about that. <laughs> Another thing I want to show you now, and this is where um, I, I picked up some videos because this came from the, uh, the article as well about the fighter pilot. Converging objects cannot be detected well in our peripheral vision. So if two things are coming together and about to intersect, in his thing, figure two fighter pilots, right? You can't see the one over here because you're converging on each other. A way to demonstrate how this might work in, the, uh, in your cars or motorcycles, take a look at this. And here I'm converging with other vehicles. They may not catch me in their peripheral vision. The next one, we're going to converge together in a four-way stop. 
remember we approached it the same, there was no relative movement. And you can think about that in your, uh, in your just interactions driving motor vehicles. You probably see that. How about when you're driving along, there's a car next to you, like right here, and you're going 60 miles an hour. It looks like they're just stopped in a parking lot next to you, right? It's, it's kind of a similar concept. So what can we do because of these things? Well, move your eyes and head to, see, to detect hazards, obviously. You want to do that. <coughs> high-vis, high-contrast gear. It's also going to help people pick you up in their peripheral vision. If, um, if these people have on high-vis, like, who do you see more in the uh, pictures here? Woman. Yeah, this person is blending into the tree line. The person in the pink... Yeah, because it's woman. <laughs> that is true. Um, and I, I'm guessing it's a woman. I can't really tell. <laughs> you must have better eyesight than me. It's probably the reason why we don't notice what color their eyes are. And yeah. We don't look up here. I'm not going down, down this road. Right. Quick, next slide. Um, yeah. <laughs> Adding lighting can improve contrast so you're easier to pick up in the uh, peripheral vision. Limit the calls. Slow down. Vary your lane position and speed. Do something as you're converging with other objects. Do something to disrupt that, con that, that relative position that's keeping you from showing apparent movement. I'd also like to point out, in, in the video I showed you, it was intersections. But it's, it could be any time cars are coming together that's converging. And I'll talk about that a little later. I also learned it in my... Um, research here that there are eye exercises. We can fix, we can maintain peripheral vision, we can add more um, functionality to it. Now this is another concept that, was, that I came across in that article, but this is very important. We have fixations. When we look, every one of you right now that's looking up here, you ha you're making very short pauses and you're processing images. You probably looked at my shirt. What's on the front of it? It's yeah, back. Um, but if you were looking off to here and I asked you to say what's on my shirt, you might not be able to tell me. But we need to fixate on things to process images. In, the, in this picture, let's say you pulled up to this um, intersection, it's a T. The circles are where you'll fixate. Let's say, so you're going to stare here quickly, you're going to look there, and over to the left. That's a typical fixation uh, demonstration. Here's some of the problems. We miss peripheral hazards. If I'm fixating here, I'll miss something around the periphery here, perhaps because I'm, I can't process that um, image as easily. Another thing, too, we miss the hazards between these sections. And I'm going to get to that in just a minute, but that's a kind of a key point uh, to what I wanted to explain. So what are some solutions? What do you think are some of them before I put them up? Well, eye movement, just, just mm -hmm. scanning back and forth. Okay. Just smaller scans. Smaller scans? Sweeping instead of... Okay. Oh, there you go. Sweep, sweep or track eyes. By the way, Keith Code writes a lot in Motorcyclist about vision. And I, I robbed from him some things, too. Um, sweeping or tracking your eyes is going to help with things. We'll talk more about that. Increase your fixation points. If you're doing three, do four. If you're doing two, do three. If you try to make more fixation points to give you uh, more information. And of course, this one too is interesting. Sounds can direct our fixations like I talked about earlier. And it brings up the point, you know, can loud pipes save lives, right? I don't, I mean, if you think about sounds, people hear something and they start to look. I'm not advocating that, I'm just saying it does bring some uh, credibility to that. And there's something called self-restriction. Um, think about, do you listen to music when you ride? Do, are you on the phone? Are you doing other things, listening to podcasts? What could that be doing? It could be isolating you when you want to interact with the world 
and you might not pick up things outside. Also, other people in other cars. You might choose not to listen to music, but is the guy in the Escalade choosing not to? No, so he could have a problem hearing us coming and recognizing us. Uh, now, coming out of, of everything I read, this was the most interesting to me. This was the most jaw-dropping to me. I didn't know this. And it's so, it's so, in, it's so integral to, to when we operate motor vehicles. There's something called saccades, and ma many of you might be aware of this, especially in the medical field. But for the average layperson, a saccade um, is basically, unless you're tracking an object, so if you watch my finger go across like this, you're tracking the object. But if, if, that's, if you're not doing that, your eyes will jump. They'll look there, they'll just randomly jump in different directions. And here's where it really gets interesting. During the saccade jumps, your brain shuts down. Think about if you ever look in a mirror and you want to see your eye look from left to right. You can't see your eyes move. Right? But if you watch me, I'm gonna, let's say I'm looking in the mirror, I'm looking at my right eye, left eye, you can see my eyes move. It's because my brain shuts the image down as not to blur the surroundings. And I hope you're thinking about where this could be going. The brain fills in gaps with peripheral vision and assumptions. Assumptions, right? So let me reiterate this again, if, you, if, you're, if you're just coming in or whatever. Understand that what I'm saying here about this, it, it can be the car driver or the rider. It's not, this, this just people who ride motorcycles don't, don't have this problem. It's not like that. We all have this problem. Car drivers, the people that we share the road with, and of course ourselves. So we, a lot of times we say, if those bastards would just pay attention to us. But the, the, the reality of it is they could be paying attention. They could be seeing one of those bumper stickers and really looking out for motorcyclists. And still, when they move their eyes, they're incapable of seeing certain things. Um, even a flash of light cannot be seen in a saccade. And I want you to just think about this for a minute. How many people right now um, driving out there are turn, moving their eyes to pull into inter, an intersection. Every single one of those drivers could miss something as they look and pull in front of somebody. Um, that's why it gets a little scary. So here's the problems. Again, this is a major impairment. This is something that, um, even if you have good vision and you're paying attention, affects every human being. And let me show you some pictures. And I stole these from the uh, fighter pilots thing. Saccadic suppression forces us to jump over important and forward hazards. Has this, have you ever ridden your motorcycle past somebody that might want to pull out into traffic? They could have seen this exact image. They, so let's say the person pulls here, they want to make a left, right, whatever. They fixate here, but their eye jumps. And what did they look over? What did they miss? They missed that motorcyclist. Their brain did not register that that motorcyclist was there. We fill in the gap with, with, with what we expect to see. Where do we expect to see? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if this pertains, but I'll just throw this out. Uh, I belong to uh, a big astronomy club in the city. <clears throat> and um, when you're looking at a bright star, and there's something very interesting next to it. It's a term called averted vision. You don't let your brain concentrate on that two, three degree. You, it's, I can't describe it, but you look, but you let part of your brain kind of look to the side while you're looking. And where I see help here is everybody tends to look at that little sure. ring. Right. But if you can kind of train yourself to this probably more pertains to a straight highway or something, you know. You brought up a good point. In my travels, when I told you about that hor horrific situation of ma macular degeneration, mm -hmm. what you precisely described is how they teach people to 
to inter, to to live with site like that, mm -hmm. that you actually would use those that, that type of mechanism, which you might find helpful mm -hmm. to transfer into here. But I haven't really studied much yeah. on that. Um, I just want to close yeah. it. Your your brain. Uh, let, let's look at say major up there. See the M. Our brain, if you're asked to look at that M, will concentrate straight on at the M. But you can let yourself also see the beginning of sure. impairment without concentrating, because your brain wants it focused there. Sure. But there's information yeah. over there if you can kind of let yourself. It, it's very hard to describe. Well, and you're yeah. also talking yeah. about controlling what you see. Mm -hmm. A lot of the points I'm trying to make, I'll try to make in this presentation is to control your sight, like you're saying, make deliberate um, <clears throat> uses of your eyes. Another problem with cicades is a fast moving head turn <laughs> increases the suppression, the masking they call it, and decreases fixations and hinders your peripheral vision movement and detection. So if I make a head turn like this, I've just it made this, <coughs> I've, I've made this jump happen maybe longer and I, I process less information. We fill in gaps of what we expect to see. Where do you expect to see a Vespa? In the showroom. In the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't expect to see one in the bathroom when I came here. Now that, that, that's seen some pretty bad stuff and it hasn't even left the showroom yet. <laughs> but again, we never know what we're going to find. We, but we think we're going to go in there and it's just going to have potpourri and all kinds of nice stuff in there. But instead, there's a motorcycle. Cicades even mask high-vis and lighting. If you think about this, uh, this rider right here, even if they have uh, the Biggest HID lights you can put on the motorcycle, high vis jacket. You could miss them just as if they were wearing all black um, and very small. We cannot see lighting and high vis things in our cicades. We are temporarily blinded in those movements. So here's some solutions. Make deliberate actions, and you know we all have fallen prey to this. I think I'm going to stop today for a stop sign, or I don't think I'm going to. Or we go out to a country ride with our friends, and we, and everybody wants to just keep going through the stop sign, right? Um, to help prevent us from screwing up, because a car could be in a cicade if I'm pulling into traffic on my motorcycle, now, I might miss the car. Make deliberate actions. Stop completely. Don't try to beat the light. When you enter the flow of traffic, signal. Let the world know you're coming out because you may not see them. Give them a heads up. Those types of habitual deliberate actions will, can help. A slow moving head, just like everything with a motorcycle. No action you take on a motorcycle should be abrupt, even if you have to make a quick stop. It still needs to be what? Smooth. Control and smooth. That is a skill. Move that head slowly as you observe. This may be difficult, but try to sweep with your vision as if you're tracking my finger versus jump, versus ding, ding, ding all over. Which controlled jumps might work. This is also big, left, right, left again. The fighter pilots call this the lookout scan because um, actually that's coming up next. They, this is just left, right, left. Uh, if, if I look here and I see the motorcycle, I know. But what if I, um, my scan is here and I look there first, he wasn't there, but then if I look a second time, he'll be there. Just once won't do it because Let's say I look at this, I'm looking for the motorcyclist to come. If I look, I don't see movement in my peripheral vision around my fixation. I see that, then I go. But if I take another look, now he, I might fixate on a place where I can see the movement in the peripheral of that fixation. That's that concept. But this one is something you might want to train yourself to do. I don't know if, I'd be interested to know if anybody does the, this here, uh, the fighter pilot lookout scan. Um, when, when fighter pilots look to their sides and they look next to them, they look far, they fixate far, middle, near. 
it gives them a better chance. So imagine if you pull into traffic, if you could develop a habit that you do this, you pull into traffic and you fixate far, middle, near, you're less likely to miss something. Make eye contact. What do you think eye contact? I think it's a bunch of baloney. <laughs> For cars that are moving that fast, that far away, you can't see your eyes. And that's a good point. Uh, I'm ultra conservative, really. Never hit a speeding ticket. I'm low and slow. Um, I do not go through an intersection first without downshift things. Okay. And I'm looking for the guy's eyes to look at me. Mm -hmm. And if I don't see the guy looking at me, I'll downshift again. Mm -hmm. okay. You know. Now, you're yeah. both kind of right. Yeah. Now, Myron, you're thinking, well, someone could be on Bluetooth. Right? They're not they're looking right through me. Beth? Well, after I make the eye contact, then I smile and nod. Okay. <laughs> so I get Let me tell you why I do something. Let me tell you why we're all kind of right and we're all kind of, you know, we, there's something to think about. Here's what the fighter pilot said. If you're coming towards me, you're on your motorcycle right now driving this way. I'm the car driver you want to make eye contact with. Watch this. Tell me, I'm going to do it twice, and you tell me if I saw you first or second time. You're riding towards me. I'm going to take my head check. Or this. When did I see you? Which one? Of course you did. You didn't look at yeah. I'll do it again. You I'll, you're riding towards me. I'll do it again. Or first the first one. Now, even if even if they do not, if you're if they're not, oh, there's a motorcycle coming towards me. I better wait. If you see their head stop, so either whether they're thinking about it or not, they've so they they've picked you up. Does that make sense? It's a big assumption. Yeah, it's, you still can't trust it, but you I'm, you, I'm, you, you still got a can't chance. trust it. But I'm telling you, if you look at that person and that person goes like this. They miss you in their saccade. They don't stop and fixate on what they picked up in the peripheral vision. I'm just saying it, it, it's not going to cure all 100% of the time, and it is an assumption, but eye contact, not for the sake of I want to make sure you see me. I'm saying it's more so that we see them stop at least to pause. That's, again, and what I have to say here, I, I did not like uh, peer review or research any of this stuff. I'm just telling you what a fighter pilot said, um, and, and some things putting it to different uh, use. And that's why you want a motorcycle that really looks good so that it <laughs> catches their attention. Because I've had cops stop me just to look at my motorcycle. <laughs> right. But again, it's like a cicade. It could be, it could be, you know. Yeah. That's why we have a horn. Right in the yeah, Byron? You could say, for me, the important thing is, if I see a car coming down the road, and he does one of those quick things, I know he's one of those jerks. He's in a hurry. Give him room. If they come to the intersection slow and they take their time, they're more likely to see it. I'm interested to hear you say that a little bit later. We'll talk about a okay. situation where an elderly person came to an intersection, and maybe did they have problems? One thing on eye contact, riding a lot on a pedal bike, you learn that not to trust eye contact. You have to trust recognition of eye contact. And there you have right. you have more speed difference to wait for recognition to see mm -hmm. that. But eye contact, you know, we're not we're not all going to subscribe to the same belief on it. What I'm just telling you is, if someone doesn't appear to make eye contact with you if, as you approach, mm -hmm. you're increasing the chances it's this situation here that their head did not pick you up. You're familiar with the gorilla experiment, of course. Yes. Mm -hmm. You tell people to look at the basketball, yeah. count the basketballs, and the gorilla goes across. Yeah. Right. We see what we're looking for, and that comes to expectations. Um, also, to avoid problems, of, uh, change your lane, position, and speed. To understand that people may, you could be this rider, and to be aware that they might come out in, in front of you or whatnot. And again, um, high vis lighting is good, but um, you just want to make sure that don't rely too much on it. Oh, hey, I got a high vis jacket on. The whole world sees me. Everything's great. Because it's only a tool in your box to, to help get you through that. Now, um, those were the those were some new points. Now, looking ahead, that's pretty common, right? Um, we've heard this all in motorcycling. What are you going to process in this picture? What types of things are important? Stop right there. 
stop sign. These cars turning, right? Right now we know they could they could have you in a saccade. They could pull out. They could think there's no one there. Expect no one. When it comes to looking ahead. If you want to break it down into definitions, looking, and we use these words interchangeably a lot, looking versus seeing. Looking is just gazing in a direction. Seeing has some mental reflection along there. Whether you use the word looking or seeing, this is what we want to make sure we're doing as much as possible. I don't, whatever you want to call it, but that's the process that you want, you want to be thinking as you're rolling along. Here's some problems with looking ahead. Where do people look? Sometimes. At their phone. <laughs> well, down. Right there. In the, who, uh, there's some rider coaches in here. And we tell people to what? Get their heads up. Look up. If we're looking down, we can't detect hazards as easily. Right? And... If you look down, if you look down outside the car window as you're going along, how fast is the road going by? Really fast. As you lift your eyes up, it slows the picture down. And you don't, you might not know it, but as you're looking down, there's more anxiety involved. Um, this is another thing. As you look ahead, your eyes will randomly dart around. And in that darting around, when you move your eyes, you're going to lose. Point about a third of a second refocusing on that new thing. So if I was to look at every one of your faces, every time I was to look at a new face, it would take me at least a, a third of a second to, to refocus on that. And uh, now that's not to say don't move your eyes. But w with this one, try to make your fixations count. Because every time you move them, if it's random, now you're randomly adding time. But if your fixations are more deliberate, then it's kind of worth the, the trade-off. Now here's the problem with telling people to look up too much. Do we have to look down sometimes? Mm -hmm. Yes. So if, if you're, you heard your writer coach say, don't look down, keep your head and eyes up, then you go through an icy intersection, or you don't notice something on the, on the intersection uh, surface, oh, I'm going to keep my head and eyes up, don't look down. And then pff, something could go wrong. That's why you still have to look at those surface hazards. Here are some solutions. You want to obviously look 30, 20 to 30 seconds ahead. Your wide view will connect with uh, your peripheral vision to your central vision. It also slows your sense of speed-related anxiety. And think about this too. If the world is coming at you faster, will you have less time to process that? Yes. But if you look up, slow your scene down, now you get more time for your eyes to process that information. I thought the term was speed related fun. <laughs> I know, it sounds like it was speed related fun. The other thing to add in there yeah. is. <laughs> Things is you're following distance too. If you've got a car right directly in front of you and you're really following too close, as most people do now because we've got better brakes, and yes. that car is eliminating a huge amount of <coughs> field of vision that you should be able to see as yeah. looking for hazard. If there's a car right in front of you, that's why I, I tell everybody. <coughs> yeah. well, that's the next slide. Distance. So I'd love to hear what you have to say about that uh, on the next slide, really, Jerry. Um, another thing we can do here is develop conscious control of our eye movements and involuntary jumps. Like I said earlier, if we, um, you know, if we're in control, you want to take control. Don't you've lived your whole life letting your eyes do random things? What I'm suggesting you do is start to actually laser use use them, use them as if it was like my hand picking up this water, my eye going to find this thing. That's kind of a different concept to a lot of people. Uh, also, use slower sweeping eye movements and versus less jumps. Now watch, if I, if I change my fixation points like this, I'm losing how much of a second every time I move it? A third of a second. But what if my, I sweep my eyes? Then I don't lose that third of a second. You're like, what's a third of a second, guy? It's not a big deal. Well, if you look from your speedometer to the car in front of you back, 
that's 0.7 seconds at 30 miles an hour, it's 30 feet. This is probably 20 feet from there to the wall. So you, just refocusing and moving our eyes around, we're covering distance. Now follow the seam through a section of the road, and you're going to cover a football field about that time. <laughs> Have the speed limit. No faster. Um, and he, this was a really interesting concept. You can't see the, the, uh, the letters here, but sweep vital surfaces along with your horizon. So as you make that turn, right now this rider is looking far ahead. They want to go this direction. So they will look their visual horizon, then sweep this area for problems, and then lift their eyes up. So how this might look is, I'm looking straight ahead, I want to turn this way, so I'll sweep my eyes down and sweep them back up. Now I haven't lost any of this refocus cycle. But even if you have to look, you know, actually make fixations, it's still better to do that than miss uh, that oil there. Now following this is, Jerry, do you, think it's do you think it's because people's brakes are better today they tailgate? I think that tailgating didn't exist when there was model manufacturers before. are trying to take the responsibility away from the drivers in the point where everybody feels their car is so safe. Yeah. You know, in another couple of years, it's going to drive itself. Uh, they no longer really feel the responsibility. I, w I watch cars go by on 250. There isn't even 10 feet yeah. between the cars. Here's the pr here's why that happens. And I'm a driver and teacher on the side too, but. Um, and, and so I talk about this almost daily. If you don't crash into a car this far away, then you get closer. And hey, I've been this far and never crashed. You know, so you know, I'm, I never crash when I'm right off their bumper. <laughs> and so I guess I'll never crash. <laughs> That's the flawed thing. Now I teach a lot of teenagers, and their they, their parents are teaching them, and they always use this. How do you know how much following distance to have? Well, for every 10 miles an hour, a car length. But when we learned how to drive, cars were all the same size. F-150, smart car. And, and t kids can't even tell you who the vice president is. They're going to figure out 48 feet or a car length. That's why we've changed it over the years. Not me. I didn't have anything to do with it. But um, it's called the following distance. Yeah. I'm just curious. Uh, this is really old school, but I don't consider brakes being good or whatever. It's a matter of a square inch of rubber on the road. Okay. So if you're going fast, well, your brakes will be great. You can lock up, whatever. you got good brakes. But that, you know, another vehicle with more rubber touching on the road, um, doesn't that kind of come down I've, to how much, you know? I've heard more, well, you got more surface area, so the car stopped better. I heard more cycles take longer to stop because whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know the facts on that. We can't we have enough to think about then, geez, okay, they're in a big Escalade, I'm in this. They're going to stop quicker than me. I'm on a new BMW with ABS. It also got the traction control on it. We don't want to think like that. Let's make it a no-brainer. This works at any speed, this following distance concept. It prevents the rider from being blindfolded, like Jerry was saying, and it opens up the view. It's very simple now. If, you teach, if you're teaching someone how to drive, welcome to 2015. This is how we do it. A car is at a fixed point, a garbage can, a, a, a bridge shadow underneath. You count 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. If it takes you three seconds, that's your following distance. Yeah. I've driven for many years, back and forth during rush hour and 490, 390, yep. all those things. It's my opinion that if you leave more than one and a half seconds, in between, Somebody somebody's going to fill that space, and now you're you down to back off even more. Okay, so let me ask you, you this, you Myron. Break, you back off more, but if you back off to three seconds, somebody else. Is I don't want to put you on the spot here. <laughs> so, but then what you're saying is, you got no choice. Yeah, you no, have to ride bumper to bumper. No, I won't agree. With I said that. one and a half right. seconds. Let me explain. You back off. Well, more. one and a half seconds. My mother and my father, my parents taught me how to drive. I'm telling them I can't drive with them. Because here's, and if you do this, I challenge even Myron. If you're in that right lane, and you're, let's say, going a little over the speed limit or speed limit, yes, cars will come in. But they're so hot to trot, they're not going to last very long there. And the goal, it's the goal to get more distance. It's not, 
oh, you know, I, someone can't be in there for a moment. You ease off the accelerator, they go away. Let me show you why. <clears throat> right now, I'm tailgating someone. I see this guy and the people over here. I'm riding blind, I'm driving blindfold. He's driving for you. Now watch this. As I back up, I'm starting to see more of your faces. God, you're gorgeous. And now, now look at this. The car is tiny, and I see everything else. You, the other guy, who said the other guy's driving for you? Precisely. On a motorcycle, it, it's even more um, important that we do this. Let's just take a look at a situation here. I want you to watch this video of me following a trailer. So exciting. What would you be thinking about? Back up. Yes, yeah, you yes, can't see, yes, you can't yes, see yes, anything please. in front of him. You didn't see that car in the intersection? All right. Let's watch it again. He probably can't see you back there. No, I was, yeah. in, a, I was in an arrow. I just turned from an arrow. Yeah. Yeah. He can't see you. Did I let him pull away? Yeah. In yeah. time for that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and the person could see me then. These are some of the problems with following distance. And here's why you, excuses or what other people are going to do, we can't control. We can control what we do. All right? We can't just, you know, everyone's a real, a real pain in the ass out there. i I, I got to drive like a nut because of them. That, that, that doesn't make much sense. Without following distance, we can't see hazards, not enough time to react, and you're hidden from other people. What are you supposed to do? Well, back off at least three to four seconds. And just to give the folks that might be a little skeptical a statistic, and I know statistics, you know, whatever they are, but I'm going to ask you a question. If I go from three to four seconds, I had one second... What percent do I decrease my crash risk by? Take a guess. 80%. 80%. It's a good thing most of you are sitting down. That's a big number. Now, if I go from 3 to 4, 4 to 5, I get another 80% drop. Another second, it drops another 80%. And I tell my driver ride kids this. If you give yourself six to, six to eight seconds on a regular basis, I could almost virtually eliminate crash risk for you. But what happens? They creep up, they creep up, they creep up, because, hey, I've never rear-ended rear anybody. So it's not, it can't ever happen. And that's where we fall into traps. And, of course, position your body more obviously. You know, a lot of the newer cars, John, a good new Subaru, if you have it on this so-called eyesight, if somebody pulls in front of you, and that's activated, it backs you right off to whatever you set that level at. So it's automatic. That's pretty, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. It's kind of like a cruise control for yep. this problem. Can I give you a, a, yeah. another point of view? Yeah. Picture somebody who's waiting to come into traffic. And there's this whole row of cars that are bumper to bumper, or, or running, running very close. And all of a sudden he sees a gap that is four or five seconds long. Guess what he's going to do? But you'll be ready for it. Yeah. Well, that's, if that's you give them a four or five right. seconds, yeah. you, you right. should make that gap big well, enough so we're that they get, can get in. That's, okay. Listen, that's a good point. And again, I'm presenting you with information. Right. You know, I I am not here to to be condescending or tell you how to how to ride your bikes and drive your cars. I'm just presenting you with information, and you have years of experience to 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 back up what you believe. Um, let's take a look at target fixation. <clears throat> now, before I get into this. Target fixation, who's heard of it? You've heard of this, right? Who has it? If you've been on a motorcycle, it's a big deal. What is the difference, then, you think, between target fixation and regular fixation? Is there a difference? Yeah. You're going toward long. You go to the streaming order for one? Long. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Yeah, is that, <laughs> uh, tell us more about that, the scene. <laughs> Target fixation would be more, I'm staring at Marcin on the BMW, and I'm fixating at him, and I'm going to drive right towards that thing. All right? Who's now, now, I'm going to look around, and there's Frank sitting on GTL. All right? I just kind of took a quick glance. Which one was target fixation? More staring at that thing. Fixations, we can't stop. This is innate to our eyes. 
and we're going to look at different things. Yeah. Now, most commonly, uh, well, a lot of times we hear this. Okay, well, in layman's terms, it means you go where you look, right? You go where you look. What does this suggest uh, we should do as we're riding that? If, if this common phrase, you go where you look. It's suggesting you want to look where you want to go. Well, give me some more details. That, that's the well, same thing. If, if, you see, if you see a hazard, you want, it, you, like somebody getting their mail at the mailbox on 250, mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> you keep your eyesight, your, your fixation uh, closer to the center of the line. You don't fixate on the person getting their mail at their mailbox because you tend, you'll tend to come right over that yellow line. If you do what? Fixate. If I fixate, right. now we have to look for the kid on the bicycle, right? But I, I'm, I had more time to think about that question than you, obviously. <laughs> and some of the things that I believe it suggests is that we have to focus more on our central vision to guide us and rely on our peripheral vision to tell us about those hazards, the woman at the mailbox. Mm -hmm. And gosh, I hope my peripheral vision's working well today. That was, that's what I think that suggests. Also, just being a person who rides <coughs> motorcycles and drives cars, I thought overly active eye movement might, I'd go this way, I'd go this way, I'd go this way, and I couldn't track myself in, on a line, let's say. What I also have pondered is that I believe target fixation is more a factor when there's a change in direction, whether it's intentional or not, right? So if I want to make it through a curve, I'm going to fixate on my exit. I'll, it'll draw me there. If I'm going to hit the car, I'm fixating on the car. It's going to take me there. That's the intentional or not. Target fixation will probably draw you in the direction you want to go if you're looking long enough, right? Now here are some problems. Actually, before I get into the problems, I will tell you that since May, I've been working more on looking in different places. And I have found that I get, I'm getting more information processed. It doesn't take me off my line. It, it, I feel more comfortable when I do it. And I'm going to show a couple of things here on the next slide here with the problems. Let me see, did I want to show you this video first? I'm going to play part of the video first. And I want you to uh, think about where you'd look. All right. Um, low fuel. <laughs> low fuel. <laughs> now that now that I've shown you that video. Here are some of the problems with target fixation. You can miss hazards that lead to mishaps, right? Dependence on random jumps or peripheral vision to identify hazards. Remember, our peripheral vision, if I'm, if I'm looking target fixation on my exit of my corner, gosh, I hope nothing comes out. I hope I see that deer before it's a problem because it's in my peripheral vision. Or I have to depend on a random jump to see that deer. If I random jump here or here, I might miss the deer there. I may not process clues, like the surface or warning signs. And of course, this is what we're most commonly familiar with. I might fixate on the wrong things, the guardrail, other vehicles, things I don't want to hit, the pothole, whatever it may be. Here's some solutions now. Um, there's something called the orderly visual search pattern. You ever heard of it? This goes back to driver ed probably. For, it, what it basically means is if you're driving a car, I look ahead, I check my speedometer, I look ahead. I check a mirror, I look ahead. What am I doing every other glance? Going back to the, Going back to the central uh, where your direction of. More fixation points is basically what I want to go at with that. Also, scan the entire field of view more to compensate for the weaker peripheral vision, because it doesn't process details. Glances will work, as I reiterated my experience. You might want to try it. I know that you can't get on a bike, most of us, uh, today, but you might want to try this. Vasim gets a chance today to try it. Yeah. So other people rode in, too. 
follow clues. We're so absorbed. I think uh, Sergey turned on that motorcycle and the, the, the dashboard where he's like, it looks like my laptop computer, all the stuff on there. There's so many other things to take our eyes off the road. We might miss important clues. If you see these things, really get the scan going. Expect a hazard. Has anybody ever gone around a corner with a big old smile on their face? Till they, who's done that? Now you go around that same corner, there's a stop sign right there. Did you ever miss that one? I have, I can think of two occasions. I had to change my shorts when I got home. <laughs> if I would have just been paying attention, I would have seen that. <clears throat> I mean, when you see deer signs, they put them where there's more deer. Matt. One, thing, one thing that I learned, too, and unfortunately it was after um, an accident at the track, was um, conscious fixation. Okay. Yep. Where I was going wide, and instead of actually just looking through the turn, picking an object that's at an extreme okay. direction you want to go, and using that to help draw you mm -hmm. in that direction consciously, right. and yes. then getting off of the object. Right. What Intentionally or not, if we fixate longer, we will hopefully usually go in that direction on, on, in most cases. Also, let, this brings it up. Look at this. What do you, do you see my notes? <laughs> um, longer fixations where you want to go, especially when you're in trouble. Now I'm going to show you the video in its entirety. See if you were looking in the spots I might have been. That's this is the original. Where would you look? All right, now that okay, the previous me would have been like, I'm riding through, I want to go around this curve. I hope that peripheral vision shows me if someone's coming out of the street here, if there's someone, maybe they're hidden behind a sign here. That was like the previous way I operated it, it, most of the time, right? But now, what do you notice about those other circles? You're still ignoring the low fuel light. I am ignoring the low fuel light. Where's your speed? Um, <laughs> I didn't want to put everything. Right? Um, we can't really you know, see listen, it from back there. I'm sorry, Mike, getting too that old. I didn't. I'm sorry, I didn't check my brake fluid right. Okay, well, that was all. Is that but, part of your pre-ride check, John? I would be getting ready to be blinded by sun glare. Yeah, you know what? I going through my videos trying to find the right one. I didn't really want to use this one because it talked about sun glare, uh, or it didn't talk about it. It shows it. And I didn't want to have to really introduce that on the topic. But you're right, that, that adds a whole new level of things. But again, I made, the, I made this one the big one. Kind of like that orderly visual search pattern, right? I'm going to look here, check a mirror. Look here, is there someone pulling out? Look here, there's brake lights on there. And, and, and keep going back to that central, that's my <coughs> main focus where I'll spend most of my time looking. Now someone talked about cars today. This was, anyone get motorcycle consumer news? This, this, all my research kind of reminded me of this one article about the design of cars and motorcycles from, I think, March several years ago. But I want to, we're going to talk, take a break right now to talk about modern car design because not only do I have information from the fighter pilots, but this car design information together was just really um, important stuff to me. Um, <laughs> In 1977, nice BMW, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, the person, the people that designed this car, back in let's say earlier days of the 70s, flexibility and grace was style, <clears throat> light, darting design, aero concept, super thin pillars, larger glass areas. Good visibility. The body was slim and the windows are tall. The waistline is kept low. What they, what, what they talk about in, I guess, designer circles is the waistline is here, okay, where the window meets the door. And now fast forward to 2013. Quite a nice looking car, isn't it? 
I think we'd each like to have one of these in the driveway, right? Mm -hmm. But we've come a long way. Chunky design, whether it's for the features of side impact crashes or what, just what people like. I think if you, if you think of the, the first Hummers, right? That was, that was really the first thing I saw with tiny windows, as I can recall. And then they became civilianized, and then they were really small. But strong and assertive is the, is the goal now. The hammer concept of power, not a, not a darting arrow. The, p the pillars are thicker for whatever reason, for rollover, because they want to put stuff airbags in them. Whatever reason, looks better. Now we have less visibility. The glass areas um, are less visible. And, of course, the body thick, windows short. Waistline has risen. So the doors are bigger, windows are smaller, and if you notice, to offset this, they've had to increase rim size on vehicles. Because if you take a look from the 70s to now, you can see the actual tire height itself gets smaller and the rim gets larger. It's to offset. I actually did a Photoshop real quick and took this wheel and put it here, and it does not look balanced. It doesn't have that solid... Uh, look as easily to balance out that visually large bottom and then a smaller canopy. How, now, what does this mean? We'll take a look at this, the trend. Can you see the trend in just uh, Mercedes? The high waistline, the bigger pillars, smaller windows, right? It's pretty clear there, isn't it? Yeah. It's also clear with the Camaro. Yeah, right here. Both the new Camaro and the new Mustang. Can't both see out of them. One time each, never again, because you can't see out the back. Right. You wonder why they're doing it. But see, someone looks at the car on the right and says, that's, I want that. Now, sporty cars and expensive cars aren't the only thing. This is an Escort in 81. Now here's an Escort here. You can see the trend. Now, in a smaller car, I mean, they can't really raise this. And I'm noticing, because I can't look at cars the same anymore when I'm driving around, almost, if you have a straight window like this, your car already looks dated. Every car now is tapering these things off. The, the back windows are tapering up into these points because that's, the des that's what designers think people want. And one last one, uh, this was one, we're pretty all familiar with this one. The first time we saw this car, we're like, what the heck? Yeah. Why are they on a chopped roof on it? Yeah. <laughs> um, but you can take a look at the waistline and the windows. All right? So I, I've beaten that concept to a pulp about the new car design. But this one here, and again, I just want you to think about the, I, the I didn't see him concept. Here are some of the problems with it. First of all, what do you think the first problem is with I didn't see him or her? It's still your fault. You're not accountable. <laughs> no, what's the, the, the tangible effects of that? Right. Somebody gets hurt. Somebody's property gets damaged. All right? Somebody's in the hospital. The I didn't see him or her consequences. That is the biggest problem, right? Along with that is we can't turn back time. I can't go back in time and really make that deliberate stop at the stop sign to make sure that I saw that car. And this one, you know, this is where the tomato throwing would come in. Fault is irrelevant at this point. If you talk to riders long enough, they will blame, um, I'll think of some obscure person in history for all their problems. Rudolph Diesel. There you go. All right. <laughs> Thank you. And you know what? That wasn't a plant. He actually did that on his own. Uh, but fault is irrelevant at this point. All right. Blame. Now, of course, if there's compensation for some sort of injury, yes, fault is definitely relevant. But I'm saying to the tangible effects of what might happen to the rider. Now, here are some solutions to the I didn't see him. High vis effective lighting. Make sure, try to get something on the high vis. Maybe not a full on jacket, but try to get a, a, a waist. Um, I use waist belts wrapped around me. I have a couple high vis patches on my jacket. Get something high vis on you. Maybe even add lighting. Except you are invisible. Again, another, another tomato moment. 
Who hasn't heard this before, ride like you're invisible? I want, please, think about, if, I, if you were teaching someone how to drive, ride a motorcycle, and you said, ride like you're invisible, they'd be like, what? What are you talking about? I don't know what that means. How would you explain it to them? Everyone's out to get you. Everyone's out to get you? Nobody can see you. Nobody can see you. Okay, so they don't see me. I won't brush my hair today. What does, the, what does that matter, right? Obviously, you want them to see you so they don't pull in front of you. Here's, after I've done more reflection than you, writing as if you're invisible basically means anticipate where others want to go and don't be there. Right? Because if you're invisible, they can't see you, but let's say you were invisible and they couldn't go right through you. They would, they would actually hit you. You would put yourself where they weren't. Vary your lane position and speed. Ride in areas not used by others. And I, I'm recycling some material I've done in the past here. Look where these like red areas are. Typically on the road, a car doesn't take up the whole lane. There's shoulders. There are places people don't want to go. The, these people are probably not going to ever go on the shoulder. I'm not either, but I do have something that I've referred to in the past with these lane edges, and I'm going to put a picture now for you. Uh, you know, if, if you were taking a, a regular motorcycle class, left, right, center, three lanes. We know if, as we ride, there's actually an infinite number of slices that we have here. These are just generalities. Well, the edge lanes are these parts that you may not even use. And, I'm, and if you take a look here, to compensate for someone's cicades to come over, if I'm in their blind spot, if they don't look, whatever the, if their car doesn't, ha doesn't have any windows, because we're looking through peepholes now, right? They're so tiny, these windows. I am not going to put myself anywhere. If they come over, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to try to be in a part of the lane they don't want. Am I going to stay here? Not usually. I'm always, I move all over the place. And, you know, sometimes I get a little nervous if people I'm riding with are closer to me because I will use, I'm constantly moving around because I'm going to put distance between us. And, and I know they usually don't go that far. Now, what if this guy swiped over? Does that kind of screw up my plans? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. But that is just a, a rare instance of people changing lanes, perhaps. Um, Aren't you putting yourself out of his right-hand mirror vision there, though? Right, but, so in, in essence, if I go to default back to that logic, which is fine for you to think of and do still, if I'm going to stay in this right, okay, if I stay here in this right portion, and they don't see me, now I have a refocus focus cycle, and I, and I can't pick him up in my peripheral vision for whatever reason, by the time I know what this guy's over, what good does it me do to make sure that I'm lined up in his mirror? See, I eliminate a lot of that problem by being in a part of the road this person doesn't want. I understand this is something people don't want to do, they don't think is necessary, but I find it to be um, a, a good insurance policy. All right, because, and I think we've had that discussion before with friends I've had it after I talked about these. They're like, no, you're better off just putting yourself out of the blind spot in their mirror. But watch this. I, I make a cicade past my mirror. Could I miss you in my mirror? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could not pick you up in the peripheral vision in my mirror. You could be in my mirror in that car. I could still jump over you with cicades. I could still not look there or pick you up. And I like the added benefit of being nowhere near this guy when he changes lanes. It's the yeah. difference, too, of having a reliance that that driver is going to look for you versus taking it into your own hands. Right, right. as if you are what, Matt? Invisible. Invisible. I, would, I wouldn't even pass them. I don't, I don't like passing people on the right. I mean, Why? period. <laughs> this was, um, I mean, you should, you should pass on the left if possible, but in this situation, I want to get around that guy or whatever. You ever have someone going slow in the left lane? Okay, there's a previous, this is a clear example. Also, on the other way, it would work as well. Yes? Um, I was lucky enough to have you last year here at this class, and there was a term you used that I always thought about, 
um, and stay out of the pan. The wolf pan. Yeah, you, you call it that. So um, another gentleman alluded, like, when you say you're on the expressway and there's an opening you get here, my father used to say, well, okay, if you guys are all going the same speed uh, and you're five or four seconds behind these people, then how much quicker are you going to get to the destination? Right. Four or five seconds. Right. It's you know, not, so, you know, the time you're going to save, yeah. yeah, you might not stop for that one light, but mm -hmm. you're going to get, it, it, you add up the whole trip, it's not that much time. You think about, you might not make it to your destination by riding like a fool, right? And the more space you leave between you and the cars in front of you, the less braking you have to do, the less accelerating you have to do, so the better the mileage you're getting the whole time. Isn't that the little point? Mm -hmm. All right, well, I, I gotta move same, on. What same the concept and uh, big okay. always with on ramps, too. Okay. Always expecting this guy's gonna yeah. run right, so I stay yeah. over to left yeah. Yeah, if as I'm, far as I can and slow down. Let's say you're, riding with, you're driving with these people. Should you be prepared for them to do just about anything? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Once you say, oh, this guy, you know, I spent four and a half hours on a Sunday with kids driving in drive red cars. So I've grown pretty accustomed to predicting traffic patterns and what people are going to do. But, and if you try, you can pick up the same skill. Yeah. Roberta. Yes. Why are we not talking about uh, high beams? I mean, high units. Well, high beams, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a future part. Getting people's attention. Right. We'll, we'll have that conversation, I promise. This, now, the last thing about the I didn't see him, contrasting movement, contrasting background movement. A friend of mine uh, sent a video out to me uh, last year or the year before, a couple of years ago, whatever it was, and it was, it, it's called Sorry Mate, I Didn't See You. It's from Brit, Great Britain, and you could YouTube Smidzy to see the entire thing. I only pulled out the part that I want to show you, and we'll talk about what does contrasting background movement mean for judging speed and distance. Can you notice the difference? Yeah, it looks like a lot nicer car. <laughs> uh, I don't know, I you thought see it was how a Volkswagen the, the first nice time, you know, just a Volkswagen. Um, what, what <laughs> I'm to, now if you want to, if you want to help avoid this, I didn't see them concept more. Just understand, like if I'm uh, interacting with other vehicles, other vehicles are on the road. If as I'm riding. In relationship to them, their background is stationary. You have to move your motorcycle in a spot or direction that sort of lets the background zigzag behind them. It will give a better illusion to them of your sense and speed. If there's no background movement, as if I was walking straight to this person here, the background stays very similar. I'm, I'm hidden in there. Um, but I would suggest you go on to get the Smidzy information. It's a good video. Now, obstructions and blind spots. This is a big deal. Um, I, I wouldn't be covering everything if I just didn't say, obviously, hills, curves, weather, rain, darkness, those things are going to impact your sight, right? But now we have driver blind spots. Remember those car designs we talked about? Let me show you a simple blind spot. Now, with the, can you get a really clear picture there? Yeah, you got the Watch it again. I mean, if you're really looking over your shoulder, could you miss something? <clears throat> yeah. It almost hides yeah. a whole BMW. Yeah, a whole car. Right? Yeah. Now imagine yeah. you on your adventure even, GS. Now this is me. This, these videos are probably I'm most proud of, this particular slide. I think as far as interest goes. This is not very interesting. I'll show you it again. Where am I? I'm in a blind spot, right? I haven't varied my position. I'm in the same spot as I travel down the road with this person. Is that correct? Notice I also like to stay to my left edge as I'm in this, because what if he comes over? Now I was filming this, so I wanted to get that for you. Now I want you to look for motorcycles. Yeah. 
I had a hell of a time trying to keep up with that guy. <laughs> Here's real time. So, so if you take a look at these, what if I made the blind spot check that I made here? Let's watch this this guy coming up again. If right when I turn my head, I turn here. Yeah, can't see him. Then I look back and I go. I can't see him. That's why I love the lane edge because if if someone they don't want to run into me, but they think I'm not there. Why aren't you using your left mirror? You know, I worry about the guy taking videos while he's driving a car. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, as a car driver, don't you use your, your left and right mirrors to tell us on the side? <laughs> right, but you might miss them. <clears throat> you might not see them in the mirror. Um, now this, now I will tell you this. I couldn't, I saw this guy, this Honda Fit is a dog. I love my car. But, and this guy was kind of, he was moving a little through traffic. But not in a reckless manner. And if I was to do that type of thing, I wouldn't be doing it like you see these people flying through. But to remain stationary, like that first video of me next to the truck, couldn't I just have been traveling in that window pillar, yeah. unmoved at all, Too long. for the whole time I was there? Um, and the Harley guys just pulled out. And they looked at me a couple times, and, I'm, and, they, and they got off the express. Went, wow, I almost got beat up. <laughs> What's this guy filming me for? <laughs> the club's not going to like those pictures showing up somewhere. Right. I don't know if you saw the A painters. Um, I always try to get in and out of the blind spot as fast as I possibly can, too. I have some very important information coming up. I know it's, it, the, I tend to talk long and have these long conversations with you, but this is, from, this is kind of the meat. This is some of the stuff I got from uh, the, the fighter pilot. There's a concept called convergence. Convergence is the way I would describe it, vehicle paths intersecting in any way. It could be backing out of a driveway. It could be two roads coming together. It could be an intersection, right? Convergence of vehicles. Now, what is the problem with convergence? Well, no apparent movement when converging. And I don't know if I showed you these already, I might have, my convergence ones. Here's a convergence from a motorcyclist perspective. We saw this already, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's that convergent thing. It's possible that person didn't see me. It, they didn't even know I was there. Same thing with these people. Now what did we add to the mix there on the left? Trees that when they glanced to the side, they couldn't see me. Same thing here. Am I in their Am I in their windshield frame? No, you can't even see past. Am I in their blind spot? Yeah. Also, the sun's behind me, right? You see that? Yeah, that's where the a girl pulled in front of an eighteen wheeler truck here. That's why that car stopped now because before the crash, this was all through street. Now, it's kind of disturbing now that my seventeen year old's driving a car herself to think that you could stop here, look there, this fence. A 55 mile an hour truck could be very easy to miss. Consider maybe her distraction. Maybe she was really paying attention with four, four of her friends in the car, one friend and a bro uh, brother and three friends. Maybe she had a saccade blind problem. You, you, you following that? It, a lot of times it's a combination of these, these nasty uh, factors. Let me see what I got here. All right, now we go to, so those are. Some of the, uh, again, here's some other things. Similar situations above, now combined with the car flaws. Let me show you what happens now with our thick windshield frames and pillars with convergence. <clears throat> All right, now that's a big long road. Now, when did you see that Jeep? Probably never did see it. No. Right, I, but it was yeah, behind the thing. But eventually, I did see movement. When did I eventually see movement? What, what's, what was the stimulus 
for me to see movement. The intersection. What happened to our, our relationship to one another? Somebody slowed. Or, you see what I mean? Someone was going fast. It, someone disrupted that convergence. He had to stop. Again, it's, just, it's not always intersections. It could be some other convergent thing that no one is required to stop, so they don't stop because they can't pick that up. Now, this one here um, is a combination of deadly vision factors. Now, I want to, I want, let's think about all the things we've talked about because this is an intersection where somebody was killed by where I work. In October, this happened. The rider was going this direction, and this car pulled in front of him, killed him right in that intersection. Now we're through again. Do you see any problems here? Big tree right there. Yeah. Right? Big tree. Big tree. Right? Now we're going to get in this car. This is the last thing a woman saw before she pulled in front of a motorcyclist and killed him. Yeah. Um. Hmm. Now here's another approach, just a second trip I took. Yeah, with the sun. Now the sun's there, but let's just say the sun wasn't there. Are there a lot of problems here? Yeah. Right. Now let's go back to this. Let's talk about combinations. First of all, let's talk about the rider's flaws. Wasn't that rider an older rider, but a new rider? I don't know about that, but I will tell you this. The guy was 68 years old. The driver of the car was 73. Now, my parents are that age, and I don't see them as old people. We have a, this is a very large segment of our population, driving. Now, you're not, from my perspective here, you're not in a car, you're on your motorcycle. What did we talk about today that could indicate to you this car might pull out? If you get invisible. Huh? I look, I look at their wheels. I look at no, the front wheels. I, I know for, so you're looking at the wheels, right. But, but again, they could be completely stopped. I used to assume what they would tell, pull out. Could, could yeah. someone completely stop? Their wheels are stopped. And I like that tip. I use that tip. Is it possible... The person stops, they look, I'm in a saccade, I saw their wheel was stopped, I thought they, would, they weren't going to go, but they really missed me in the saccade, and now they're going to go. That's why I don't understand why they haven't put a brake light on the front grill of a car. You can be green as well, far as I remember. Let's go, let's continue on. So you have to think, now what if, if, he, if the motorcycle was positioned over here, or slowed down, or did something? Assuming this driver sees us, is a major problem. What's the speed limit on that? Like 30 or something, 35. This is Calkins Road, just down the hill. Just when you leave the CVS and all, you go down the hill there. Now, let's watch again here. In that situation, your visibility is better if you're close to the center line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, they can see you well, better. If I'm coming, let, well, let me ask you this. Yeah. If I'm walking down this the road here, mm -hmm. you're over there, you're turning left. I'm coming here, or I'm coming here, mm -hmm. or I'm coming here. Could I still be lost in a saccade? Yeah. Depending on where I am? Yeah. I was thinking of that frame. I don't know what you call it, where the windshield meets. Okay. The, the I, I think the closer somebody would be to the right part. Okay. It's harder to see closer yeah. to the left yeah. because it's closer to you and it's larger in your field of view. Mm. Now let's take, continue on with the video here. Because this, this one's a big deal. So now we're approaching, let me get close here. Of course you have all those obstructions, right? Mm -hmm. Now watch, if I'm here, let's say the motorcyclist was here the instant she looked. Or the moment that they looked, because they looked once here. Now do you see the pedestrian? Yeah, but you're going to see the moving truck probably before you see the pedestrian. You can't see anything in a saccade. You're totally blind. Well, so if the motorcycle is close to the rear of the truck, you're not going to see it. And you think as soon as the truck goes by, you've got a gun it. Because, I, I mean, I had, I don't know, maybe five years ago, I had an incident where 
I always stop for amber lights. I'm unusual right. for Rochester. <laughs> amber doesn't mean go faster, it actually means stop where I grew up. And I was at, um, where was I? It was um, Jefferson Road. I was heading eastbound. I'd just gone under the 490 road, whatever it is, 590 there, right? And there's that mall on the right. So I stopped at the traffic light. As the light went amber, I was in the right lane. There was another larger vehicle to me in the left lane. We both stopped for the amber light. There was another vehicle behind that larger vehicle in the left lane. He didn't see me, so he decided he was going to nip into that lane where I was situated to run the light. So I actually had to gun it into the middle of the intersection to avoid being rear-ended because he saw me in a split second and went sideways. So and you yeah. were watching your rear view mirror. I was watching, I always watch my rear view mirror on the bike. Yeah. Yeah. I you know, especially stopping for amber lights. If the guy, if I start to slow down and that guy behind me starts to get close, I'm running the light. I don't care right. what part it is. Uh, but uh, thank you for that. Uh, but to, back to back to this woman who saw who didn't see the motorcyclist. Do you see the pedestrian? Yeah. Yeah, now, well. if yeah. if if I were to make my look then and fixate on that, I might. I'm, let's say I just fixated. I saw the truck. Okay, the trucks pass me, and I go. Right? I, I might not have picked up the girl. What I'm trying the point about this particular I, I believe that it's it's more of, of it's all these combinations of vision problems between both parties that are a problem. He didn't expect her to go. What what, what could you do differently if you're this motorcyclist? Could you look for that eye contact? Could you um, try to put yourself in a position where the, if they pull out or if they start to go? Um, Cover your brakes. How about back, contrasting background movement? Maybe there really wasn't enough. Um, all I can tell you is these are some of the solutions I would advise. Slow as you enter intersections, even if you have right away. That goes to what you were saying. Disrupt any converging vehicle peripheral vision trickery. If you see you're converging on something, look for those things, pay attention to them, and break that up somehow. And recognize it. If you're in a hurry, you you can't drive. I mean, you can't drive in a hurry. You, uh, you still have to do everything. And so many people, if they are in a hurry, they don't take the time that they exactly. normally would. Actually, that um that goes back to my point on deliberate stops. Right? Is it possible that that woman didn't make a deliberate stop, mm -hmm. and she was she made a rapid head movement? Yeah. Didn't stop, mm -hmm. lost the rider in the saccade because it was harder to see even in her. That's why make your deliberate stops. Make sure you look where you're going and, and you take those extra fixations. We can't compensate, we have to compensate for that error in other people. Now, I think there's um, just. Can I ask one other question? Yeah. Because I'm very judicious with my horn on the bike. I told my kids, all three of my kids, yeah. to ride. We all had rider training, we all had track days. Blah, blah, blah. But I mean, when you're converging on another vehicle, I always taught my kids, and I do it myself, I cover the horn. Right. I mean, I'm covering my brake, but the horn, I'm braking and horning at the same time. Right. So back out of the driveway is a perfect example. You know. um, horn can, sound can direct people's fixations to you, but they could be mired in their own thing. But typically, it'll automatically hit a brake. Yeah, people are It does, because they don't want to run into something. Yeah. Now, um, I only have a couple more concepts so that I can get you guys home to your families, but um, if you take a look at this thing called windscreen zoning, this is another concept. Um, take a look at, you're sitting in the car seat, the driver's seat there. What are some of the things that you notice? Can you, can you see pretty well? Well, windscreen zoning is our eyes do not fixate near window edges. And now this increases our saccade masking and our blind spots. I try, I've tried this. Try it when you're driving home, it, when no one's around. Try to focus on something here. It's easier top to bottom because the way our eyes work. But, if, but left to right, it, your eyes will go crazy trying to focus on something just outside here. Now our blind spot's bigger and our saccade masking is longer. And could this hit, how could this um, apply to our helmets? You've got a limited field of, field of vision in the helmet. How could this mat, this zoning affect our, our, our helmet eye port? Well, it could have this effect. I don't have research to prove it, but similar thing. 
we may not be using this part of our eye port. We might be going to look at through that peephole. Um, now, here's the problem with it, and then we're going to get to the solutions. Thicker car frames and pillars increase blind spot areas. I, I added some of that fuzz to my BMW look. <clears throat> now you see how the problem can get worse yeah. with zoning. Right? That makes sense? Yeah. And here's in real time what someone might see with zoning. So in there, it, that pillar that's already huge could, all, could be double width. Helmet eye port, I just said, could have similar effect. So relentlessly stay out of blind spots. This is a good solution. When you're in your car, lean in various directions to avoid larger saccades and find those things hidden in window frames. Move your head smoothly to avoid zoning impairments in your eye port. So you want to make sure you're turning your head to see those things when you're on your motorcycle. Another reason to make good head turns. Because fast, jerky, or no head movement can contribute to missing some information, of course, the edge lanes, again, because um, if they don't see us, they might come over. Now, I didn't really want to add too much to this, but this I thought was pretty interesting, too. This is uh, the sun. This is a very sunny day, and there's my Grizo with the light turned off. Can you see it very well? Well, um, there's the headlight on, high beam. And I just took it, I copied and pasted a couple different ones for additional lighting. I am not really a high beam guy in the day advocator, personally, because I think that it, 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 it could blind someone coming towards you. I have my own personal beliefs. You have yours. I'm also not a helmet modulator guy. I had one, hated it. You might be, you might love it. People see them. As a matter of fact, flashing light has the same effect as movement. Consider it. Maybe you'll like it. But what cannot be denied, and I would say this, here's some additional lighting you can get for your motorcycle. Actually, um, these handguards are made by Acerbis, or however you pronounce that, and they actually, are right, they actually work like lights in the handguards. But I am an advocate, starting uh, you know, maybe with this riding season, if I have the sun behind me, I may switch on that high beam. Why would I go against my high beam during the day thing there? Well, your high beam's still not brighter than the it's, sun. Right, exactly. So, the, so they're already dealing with the sun, but that high beam's going to create more contrast. And I think in that situation, high beams are great. No. I disagree. No? Well, number one, it's illegal to run with your high beams on during the day. day. And number two, there isn't a human being alive that can judge how fast light is moving. And if you blind them, they can't see it. Right. Well, during the day, I'm, I'm saying what? what if, I'm saying during the day. Okay. Because if you don't believe it, have a pitcher throw a white baseball at you as fast as he can. And you tell me how fast it's going. No, I understand during the day. Yeah. Brights will not help you. They can hinder you. I've no, never, I've never heard that it's illegal. Right, right. That's what the high beam is. Right, high beam during the day. What I'm Perfect saying... Perfect well, example of it is go stand on a train track and watch a train come at you with light on and try to judge how far away it is and how fast it is. You can't do it. Right. Nobody can. Right. Nobody can. Nobody can. Is, is the point with the high beam for the driver to judge the distance that you are using knowledge? To notice you. That, that would be it. Yeah. To, to create a contrast so they know you're there. Then they have to decide how far is the object, but they have to recognize you first. Again, I don't like rights during the day. I'm with you. But I think if you got, if you have, you want to stand out from that glare in any way. Now, this presentation I gave today, what does it all mean? There are flaws in car design and human vision are conspiring against us. <coughs> and um, I, I had a friend make me a picture, I'm about to show it. We cannot change the cars people drive, right? They're going to buy those peephole windows. It serves no purpose for us to blame car drivers for a mishap. There's no productive result from that. Even if people are looking for us, they could miss us. I, I fail to believe that everyone that runs into a motorcyclist isn't paying attention, or they might not be, but like everyone. 
rider's flawed vision also is a major factor in crash rates. Right? My friend made that. I wanted to bag on the head and he did it. Um, it doesn't look like man. Remember, your vision could be a friend or foe. I didn't even know if I'd use that. Uh, we need to be super vigilant motor, me motor vehicle operators, cars, motorcycles, whatever we're operating. Now, what can you do? Well, you're lucky because you can practice these techniques in your car over the next couple of months. And I, I actually printed out all the problem solution pages. If you want to take a copy of just those, they're the things I talked about that you could do. You don't have to remember. You could just take one, um, decide if you want to practice them or not. There also are eye exercises that you can do, and I'm not going to go through them. They're on this handout if you wanted to get a magnifying glass to read it. Juggle? Eye-hand coordination. Um, now, back to this, and here's kind of the summary of the whole thing. These, these um, awareness campaigns, remember, these, these may not be helping us at all. Uh, what I'd like you to do is just take a look at some of these. And I have numbers so we can talk about them. Which do you think, based on what we talked about over this hour and a half or whatever the heck it is, which, which ones are effective and which are, are not effective? Give me a number or give me some... Uh, number three, I think, is effective. Number nine? Now, let's go to three. All right, what, what do you think I like about three? Look twice. Anyway. Simple. Look twice. High biz. I like, I like look twice. What's that going to have people do? Look twice. Look twice, because if, if they're looking once, they might miss me in a saccade. If they look twice, they'll pick, they might pick it up. I think that look twice are two words that, could, that people know what they can say, I can do that. Mm -hmm. And then we benefit from that. But the watch for motorcycles? Well, the first thing I saw was watching motorcycles, and but I got the message. let's talk about the word motorcycle versus motorcyclist. Do you think a, mo a car driver would rather harm a, a motorcyclist or a motorcycle? <laughs> motorcycle, right? So we have, to, we have to put a human c component to this. A lot of these that have motorcycle, um, it, it, so what? Like um, let's pick another one. Which, which is another one here? I like number nine. nine. Number nine? Share the road. I like look twice for motorcyclists. Yep. Now we have the, pre the person com component and the looking twice. Plus but what's the, the first three words? Share the road. Do people really not want to share the road? I mean, there's road rage, there's people who not, but is sharing the road a, di a directive you could give to someone that really tells them specifically what you expect for them? Not really. That's why I love to look twice for motorcyclists. Um, give me another one. Number one, four deadly words. I didn't see him. Uh, what do you guys think of that one? Don't like it. I like something about it. Deadly words. It's got a person. person. It's got a person who looks like you and me, mm -hmm. and not somebody out of uh, Wild Hogs. You know? <laughs> um, it actually has someone who looks like a, like someone's relative. Uh, but now, four deadly words. I didn't see him. Exactly. So the implication is, he wasn't seen, so now he's dead. Mm -hmm. um, does it tell people how to see him better? No. Mm -hmm. No. Well, these are all late. these are all bumper stickers too, right? Well, I'm just it's, saying they could be on a, a uh, they could be on a banner yeah. here. They could be distributed. Uh, again, four deadly words. I didn't see him. Does not tell anybody how to fix the problem. It just simply says, "Oh, that's sad." Give me another one. Seven is the one you want. No, number 13. So let's go to seven. seven. John let's, 13. I want to go to seven. I want to go to seven, but then we'll go to 13. <laughs> That's your teacher. Um, <laughs> this one, tell me what you think after this presentation I might like about it. One is it shows I'm doing my part. a person. Which a is, person I like, they have a person there. It says what he's doing and asking if you're doing the same thing. Okay. Is person. that potentially misleading, Myron? Mm -hmm. This again, this 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 statement is 
The motorcyclist is never wrong. They always see what's going on. They, they don't have saccade masking. They don't have any problems. Right. They don't, nothing that afflicts them that afflicts you. So gosh darn it, knock this crap off and just watch for us. It pushes the blame to the other people. Also, how about, did you see keep an eye out for motorcyclists? Motorcycle. How do you keep an eye out for something? Eh, if I see it. <laughs> it doesn't seem very diligent, does it? I'm not going to share the road, the way to go. How do I share the road? I'm not sharing it? What? And then we got the um, <laughs> number 13. <laughs> the best one. John's a t-shirt. Could I tried to pixelate it. It didn't work very well. I'm sorry. I didn't want to, I wanted this to be G. But <laughs> what do you think this message is? An attention getter. Yeah. Yeah. This this is actually something that could be counterproductive. This person's offending me. I don't care about them. To hell with them. And of course you have those people among us. Any others? I mean huh? Ten. Ten? Ten again, we have the motorcycle, not the motorcyclist. And I like look twice, save a life, could put a connection to, hey, if I look twice, maybe I can save somebody's life. But again, put this person maybe on that, right? Because a motorcycle, a lot of people don't like motorcycles. I don't get it. But there's a lot of people out there that don't really care about these things. It's meaningless to put this on there. What's that? That's a motorcycle. Number six is kind of like number one. Six? Yeah. Are you trying to get their motivation Oh, this is cars have bumpers, bikers have bones, be aware. I don't think I get the, co the comparison very well. It's kind of grim. Drive aware, I guess that means pay more attention, but I just don't understand how that's, those few words are supposed to change someone's behavior in a tangible sense, like a look twice would. Um, five. It, was that? Like number five. Five. Okay. Yeah, five is like... Birds are everywhere. Mm. <laughs> Puddles are everywhere. Right, three is the best. Three is the best. It's a bumper sticker on the back of a car, so somebody's following you too close okay. on your in your car, and they're, they're they're looking right at it. They're able to read it, and they say, "Watch for motorcycles." It tells what, them what to what do. What I would do? What I would do though? I like it. I'd flip them. I would think the look twice, save a life. It would be the thing I want them to see first. They might not see the corner. The scene. There is a recent study that was released, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Where you said motorcycles are everywhere, the incidence of motorcycle accidents per mile driven goes down with increasing numbers of motorcycles. So when there's more, when there's more, people tend to be watching out right. for them. Right. Motorcycles are everywhere. Riding in the winter versus riding. Riding in the yeah, winter versus okay. summer is, is excellent point. So riding large paths. Um, <laughs> again, <laughs> motorcycle games. Some of they these, don't have a I, I'm <laughs> right. Everybody again, this one here too. Are they're they're looking out for you. Are you looking out for them? Again, misleading. The, 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 we, the onus is now on every other people, not us. And if you take something away from this presentation, take away that, you know, if you crash with another vehicle or you crash by yourself just in a corner, it could have been your vision. It could have been your processing of images that was the cause. Stop, you know, try not to look outside of you. For, for your safety. It comes from within you and what you see and your diligence in paying attention to, to vision um, the, and the things that you're seeing along on the road. Um, do you have any other questions? Do you do you, I'm just curious. <clears throat> I don't be a, a negative here. No, it's There's, fine. I, I tend to be so cautious and conservative. It, it's unfortunate, but I believe there's a lot of people, I don't know what percentage, that just don't like more motorcyclists. Now, you might think Hell's Angels, okay, big deal. Um, we all understand we're in the same hobby and we enjoy it. But if, if you go on the expressway, <coughs> enough, excuse me, <coughs> and you see ninjas, <coughs> excuse me, um, weaving in and out, popping wheelies, and um, it kind of gives a bad name. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times, um, it's like some people almost thinking, so what if I had a guy, or, you know, it, it just, it's a bad, it That's a bad. why our reputation, <coughs> you make a good point. You know, I don't think I've always been perfect behind the handlebars. <coughs> but the more, I like, to, I talked about courtesy in the previous one. Wave people on. Try to be that good role model so the next person doesn't get bashed. Because just like in any other thing, there's people who care about their safety and those who do not. Yeah. Or they accept different levels of risk, even in your riding group. 
You have people that will accept more risk than you, right. that you've said. Um, it's all about assuming. But you have yeah. to, you know, and again, people, there's so few motorcyclists that they see, the ones they see are doing stupid things. Mm -hmm. All I can say is we have to be the people that are doing mm -hmm. as much good. Some, and believe me, sometimes I get stupid. I, I, what am I doing? Why am I, why am I passing this person now? Why am I doing this? But in, on a regular basis, I try to do more good things to represent. Last thing, because... Uh, yeah, here's... I'm, I'm just going to put these... Um, I'm just going to put these, if you guys want to stick around, if anybody yeah, wants a copy of those, go ahead and grab yes. it. Um, but thank you for coming. Yeah. If you want to talk.